We've spent the last couple of days being wowed by the natural wonders of Yellowstone National Park. We've thoroughly enjoyed its beautiful natural swimming areas, been amazed by its geothermal activity, and discovered that the hype around the thrill of the wildlife drives is all too real. Oh, it's oh. running. Something has definitely spooked it's, it. It's up there, it's up there. Yellowstone's size is often underestimated. Believe it or not, it's larger than the states of both Rhode Island and Delaware put together. So this morning we will bid farewell to our Roosevelt cabin in the north of the park and head south. We're going to stop off at points of interest along the way before finally checking into the old faithful cabins where we fully expect that geyser activity is going to rule the roost. Welcome to our third day here at Yellowstone National Park. We've been having some really early mornings in order to be able to spot the wildlife and then also some late evenings as well in part because the drive to get anywhere in this park is quite long because the park is massive but then also we did decide to go on another little animal safari on the Loire Valley last night and so we've decided to have it a bit of a lazy morning. I think it's probably about half eight maybe quarter to nine in the morning now so we kind of missed any chances to spotting any wildlife this morning so we're just going to make our way over either to the village store or to the veranda of the lodge where the rocking chairs are just to have a bit of a leisurely breakfast we've made up some jam bagels when we were in the Grand Tetons when we had a kitchen prior to coming up here um, but we know that the village store has got hot coffee <laughs> up at the visitor centre to pick up the park newspaper and a couple of day hiking trails for around the lake area so that we are all set for today. someone has let one rip but it's just because of all of the geyser activity and it's just like the sulfur smell <laughs> underneath the earth's crust there's lots and lots of magma and lava that's moving in the hills that you can see behind me they're actually bulging and they're being pushed further and further up and those hills are are actually moving constantly so if we were to come back in like a year or two's time they probably would have, have changed in their shape which is super cool but kind of scary that we stood literally on top of a volcanic crater about 640,000 years ago the volcano here at Yellowstone erupted and after it did the land kind of collapsed and left this caldera which is what we're in at the moment so we've come along to a place called mud volcano there's about a kilometer maybe slightly less trail around and i think there's just going to be lots more geothermal activity so i'll see if i can do some reading up on the different things that are going on and i'll report back <laughs> So 
so the area around me at the moment is mostly filled with meadows and I have just learnt that back in the very late 1970s there was an earthquake which is not uncommon for this area. The trees were able to withstand the tremors of the actual earthquake itself but afterwards the volcanic activity had shifted so much the really really hot gases then started attacking at the tree's roots and they all ended up dying and that's why this is pretty much a meadow now. Just beside of me here we've got Sizzling Basin. Uh, apparently the name came about because back in the 1970s and prior to that the gases made it something akin to when you are sizzling sausages in a frying pan but of course because of the earthquakes back in the in the 70s I think it's just kind of shifted the way in which the gases come about and it doesn't really look very sizzling anymore. It does make me wonder when you are actually naming things, should you be naming things in such a descriptive manner? Because of course as the decades go on it no longer really makes sense. So very quickly walking around the mud volcano area I'm starting to realise that it's one of two things. If you get somewhere that's super active and super violent, chances are prior to the earthquakes in the late 70s it was actually a lot more placid. If we're somewhere that looks really calm and placid now, chances are prior to those earthquakes in the 70s it was a lot more violent. However we've just been up to Sour Lake which I thought was actually a very appropriate name for it and there was a lady who started talking to us and she said that she came here last night and apparently there were hundreds and hundreds of bison here and it got to the point where the ranger was having to tell everyone like you need to go back you need to go and get in your cars and in fact actually you know what I'm walking past some bison poop at the moment I don't know if you can see that on the boardwalk it's probably fresh from last night and she was saying that even though the ranger who is in essence a police officer was telling people you need to get back in your cars people were completely ignoring her and staying out of their cars she made kind of a joke I think she was kind of being a little bit serious about well you know why don't we not just let natural selection take its place and then just as we were leaving the lake further up I heard a lady say so can we swim in this lake or not well it's obviously it's bubbling away at extremely high temperatures so yeah it's all fun and games You got something in your hair? Made it down to Lake Village to quite an epic hailstorm with thunder. Um, it seems to be holding off here at the moment. We're just going to pop into the general store for a little bit of lunch. Hopefully they've got a good selection of sandwiches and salads. With the storm looming above the hiking trail that we'd considered walking and a clear view across the lake to a geyser basin that we'd intended to explore later that afternoon anyway, we made the decision to scrap our plans for a walk and drove around the lake in search of exploration that would not require us getting drenched. I am here at the West Sam Geyser Basin in the very south of Yellowstone National Park. The really cool thing about this one is that it is right on the shore of Lake Yellowstone and so a lot of the geyser activity involves the lake as well as being just off of it as well. In the early days of Yellowstone National Park people would actually come here to stand on top of this geyser cone in order to fish. People have been tipped off that you could catch your fish and without even having to take it off of the line you could dip it into the geyser cone and it would then cook your fish for you. But unfortunately lots of fishermen obviously did get scalded by the burning hot water that was inside of the geyser cone and also of course them standing on it caused damage to it. Nowadays obviously no one can actually fish off of this cone but we obviously have the understanding of historically what, what did happen here. So this here behind 
behind me is Blackpool, which doesn't really look so black now, but apparently prior to about 1991, the way in which you would have described the colour of this would have been black, and it was because the water temperature was a lot colder, and therefore the thermophiles that were growing, so the microorganisms that were growing here, were more green uh, and brown, which obviously the deeper you get starts to give off that black colour. However, in the early 90s, the water temperatures rose, which completely changed the thermophiles to the lighter colours such as the oranges and the yellows, and that is why it doesn't really look black anymore today. We were just looking at all of the geysers and there was this park ranger and I wasn't really too sure why she was here and then suddenly we just realised that we've got wildlife literally walking through the Western Geyser Basin area. ranger who has assured us that actually some of these bits of water behind us the plumbing has actually been cut off below the earth's core so there isn't the really really hot water that would cause harm to the elk however of course there's lots and lots of minerals still in that water which is really really good for the elk We have just got ourselves checked in at the Old Faithful cabins. Uh, getting back in the car because the cabins aren't actually here by the lodge and cafeteria. Um, they are way back there so we're going to have to drive around to them with all of our luggage. So this is our cabin just behind us here at the moment. We are aware that Old Faithful Geyser is going to erupt potentially in the next 10 minutes. They've said it's 6 minutes past 6 but they say plus or minus about 10 minutes time so it could be as early as 10 minutes, it could be as late as about 25 minutes from now and the crowds are already gathering. But one of the really really nice things is that, that was our cabin there and if I just turn the camera around you can see that's kind of like the prime cabin, it would be awesome if we'd been in there but that steam there that's coming out of that geyser that is old faithful waiting to erupt so we are kind of quite pleased with the cabin that we've managed to get in comparison to the roosevelt cabin it is a lot busier here we were saying that it almost feels like a town or a city of the national park most places that we've been to and as stupid as this may sound we haven't really cared about leaving something like on the back seat of our car but really everything just feels so safe around here but suddenly we pulled up outside of the hotel to go and check in and it's like oh there's lots and lots of people it's really really busy and it just it definitely doesn't have the same feel to it as what the Roosevelt does but obviously you do have such an amazing attraction right here within walking distance and then also all of the facilities like there's so many different options for where you can eat what you get and what you have to give up we'll see what we prefer after we've been here for two nights these are the crowds at Old Faithful, something akin to rush hour in London. I'll do a quick tour around our cabin that we've rented here for a couple of nights at the Old Faithful Cabins. We've gone with a Frontier cabin. We thought after the last two nights being up on a Rough Rider cabin where there was no bathroom attached to it and we had to walk across the campsite in order to be able to go to the loo, take a shower, we could see that there was a little bit of availability down at Old Faithful and decided just to pay a little bit extra for the bathroom which we're quite excited about. It's still quite basic in here. You can see that there is a bed quite small by American standards. Some of the main things that are different is that they actually have carpet in here whereas the last cabin that we were staying at had like these beautiful wooden I think pine floors and then the ceiling is like all plastered over so it feels a little bit more like a budget hotel room rather than like a proper full-on cabin. The main difference is so if I just turn around here you can see that we've got a sink where they provided us with like some soap and hand cream. If I just come back a little bit and um, we've got a door off to the side 
and inside of this uh, if I just turn it in not really enough space for me and the camera but you can see that there is an ensuite shower and also an ensuite toilet as well where they provided us with towels so there's some similarities there's some differences another thing to probably point out is that this wall here is actually adjoining another cabin so it's like a semi-detached cabin whereas the Rough Rider cabins that we had up at Roosevelt they were all as far as we could see detached cabins so you just had that little bit more privacy and you weren't going to get woken up by the sounds of other people next door we've not spent our first night here yet so we'll see we'll see what the soundproofing's like we are starting to get a little bit hungry so we're going to go off and get some dinner this is the old faithful lodge cafeteria and there's just loads and loads of different choices i'm currently queuing up to get a stir fry which is just behind me but there's also like mediterranean gyros you've got there's some slow cooked foods like a meatloaf with mashed potato and you've also got like a barbecue type thing so all like ribs and chicken wings it's very much cafeteria style you just pick up the trays and then you, you pay a little bit further down and then you go and sit in the dining room even further on i've heard online that apparently amazing view out of these huge windows of the geyser not too sure if we'll still be here when it erupts or even if we'll get a good enough table but it's pretty cool there's lots and lots of choice and keeps the costs low without having to eat the proper sit down expensive restaurants so the step over is what I decided to go for in the end um, and what I've ended up getting is some noodles with mild Alaskan pollock, poison sauce, edamame beans, broccoli and then for the toppings I got some chow mein noodles and also some green bell peppers. The whole thing came to $10.75 and then tax on top and we've just come through into the dining room to then be able to eat and I don't know if we just got really lucky or what but we managed to get the table right by the window with the old faithful guys are in the background and um, we're being told that it is due to erupt in like, 10 past now at quarter two so in about 35 minutes i'm not entirely sure if it's going to take us a whole 35 minutes to eat our food but i think we might just laze around so that we've got an amazing spot from our dinner table to watch the next eruption Okay, so we thought that we had a really good spot until the thunderstorms come in and it's really ruined the, the windows and it's making it quite difficult to see. I'm still finishing up my dinner, so I'm going to put this on a time lapse and you're going to get to see me butchering how to eat using chopsticks because I still to this day cannot really use them.